Hello everybody, my name is Kara, and today I'm here with my October wrap-up. I actually read quite a few audiobooks during this month as part of kind of an ongoing experiment I'm doing to try and make myself like them. Uh, I already did a wrap-up for those separately, so I will link that down below. And for whatever reason, I feel like I completely lost track of the order that I read some of these in, so we're just gonna do the best we can. The first book I finished was Fake It Till You Break It by Jen P. Wynn. I think that's how you said it according to the pronunciation guide I looked up. We follow our main characters Mia and Jake, and basically their moms are best friends and they have always wanted the two of them to date and to end up together. The problem is that Mia and Jake can't stand each other, so they decide that they're going to pretend to date and then stage a really dramatic breakup in order to get their mothers off their case for good. The fake dating trope is one I loved, so I of course enjoyed that aspect of it. As my friend Kelly pointed out, this book had a really stellar like fake kiss turns into real kiss moment. I think that scene was like one of the best ones in the book. And they also really liked the focus on family and on different kinds of families. The relationship between Jake and his adoptive mother was just really wonderful to see, but there was one subplot related to family that I did not think was really handled as well as it could have been, or it just wasn't as satisfying to me as I think it was supposed to be. And also, as far as the fake dating aspect, I liked some of it, but I feel like the attraction part happened too soon. I get really irritated when I'm reading a book and like the narration is like, oh my gosh, I hate him so much, but why does my heart start beating faster when he looks at me? It must be because I hate him so much. That just like really annoys me and this book did that quite a bit uh, near the beginning, so that was another reason I didn't love the relationship as much as I wanted to. Basically, this was fun, it was cute, I gave it 3.5 stars. Next I finished Ella Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine and this was a reread for me and Giselle and Taylor's kind of middle grade um, reread book club. We actually did a whole live show on it that I will link down below and I really, really enjoyed this. I really love the way Gail Carson Levine does retellings, like the aspects that she chooses to explore and change are just so interesting. I really loved Ella as a main character and how brave and strong she is, and I think when I was younger I was frustrated by how petty some of her rebellions felt, but reading it now I understand more how she felt like that was like that was the only way that she could fight back in some cases, so I think that I actually found that aspect more enjoyable now. And I really loved Char as the love interest and just as a side character, like he's just so wholesome and good. There are a few scenes that I really love, like the Three Nights of the Ball and the kind of the implications for what that means for Ella and Char's relationship. I'm being very vague in case you haven't read this yet. Um, and I also feel like the final, like the ending scene, kind of like the, the climax of the book, I think is just so well done and it got me like really emotional this time, um, so I just think that was fantastic. That being said, I did give Ella Enchanted four stars. As Taylor pointed out in our live show, it feels kind of like like a very particular kind of like 90s or early 2000s feminism where it's like girly things are stupid and Ella is definitely not the worst offender I've ever seen for this, but I just kind of get that vibes from her sometimes, which is a little frustrating. And another thing is just like enjoyment wise, I find this book actually very stressful to reread. Um, even when I was younger and like obviously I enjoyed this book, I reread it multiple times, but you know how sometimes you reread a favorite book and there's like that one scene that you dread rereading because it just like is upsetting? With Ella Enchanted, I feel like there's like three scenes like that. Um, like all of the bullying and all of the like near misses where it's like Ella could have been happy and then this one thing happened. I feel like those kind of hinder my enjoyment somewhat, but I do still think it stands up to the test of time and I really enjoyed it. I also finished Nights at the Circus by Angela Carter. This was a buddy read with my friend Kazen from Always Doing and I had such a good time buddy reading this and discussing it with her. We definitely had a lot of things to say and thoughts to exchange and things to complain about. Um, I kind of ended up hating this book, <laughs> but the actual buddy read part was great. So this is about our main character Sophie, also known as Fevers and she is a woman with wings and the premise of the book it starts out as like a reporter who's trying to expose her as a fraud so he starts like getting her life story but then it turns into him just like trailing after her at a circus and then there's like a train in Siberia and things just go completely off the rails. Um, <laughs> the beginning part of this book I actually quite liked, I think it was really interesting, the actual interview part and uh, getting to hear Fever's backstory and the reporter, what's his name, I think his name was Jack? maybe? And of course I wanted to know like is Fevers a fraud or is she actually, like does she actually have wings? Um, unfortunately though I didn't really like anything about this after that. The only other thing besides the beginning that I liked is sometimes the writing was good. Like, there were particular turns of phrase that I thought were very beautiful or descriptive or like made you stop and think, but other than that let's jump into the things I didn't like and I'm gonna start out with the writing because it was so overwrought and pretentious and like I just kept feeling like Angela Carter was patting herself on the back for how clever she sounded, even when her descriptions kind of made no sense. Like there was this one scene that I thought was so stupid. It was like this clown, I don't even know how to describe it. It was like a clown orgy, basically. 
and it was ridiculous because like it was clear that this scene was supposed to be like very like philosophical and like challenging and just really impressive and make you think a lot and it was just kind of dumb. I think the phrase I used to describe the writing when I was talking to Kazan about it is like very self-satisfied. So much of this novel read as a parody of a novel but not in a self-aware way. Like I don't think this book knows it was ridiculous <laughs> and that was one of my big problems with it. Um, I also feel like the characters were really really underdeveloped and I had a really big problem with the way this book handled the female character stories in particular. Like Fevers herself I think was more complex um, and even to an extent her companion who I can't remember the name of but other than that it was like every single woman they came across was a victim of abuse or rape or human trafficking basically or torture. Like there was so much gratuitous violence against women to the point where like it just got really like sickening and kind of frustrating because it's like can you not write a side character without making her a victim of abuse and none of that was even handled well it's not like it's not like Angela Carter used that to say something about the treatment of women or anything like that like it was just there there are a couple of personal things that I just don't enjoy that I think also hindered my enjoyment like I don't like circus settings I thought the majority of the book was going to be about the interview and learning about Fevers as a character and like the reporter so I didn't know there was going to be this huge chunk set at the circus so I really didn't like that and I also didn't like like the whole like last third of this book it seems like took place in like a wasteland type survival thing which I don't like survival stories but I kind of think that even if you do like this wasn't really a survival story it was just boring it was like people were just wandering in a frozen wasteland <laughs> like there wasn't even any like survival aspects outside of like the author killing off various characters because she got bored of them or she like didn't know what to do with them this is also one of those books where like the gratuitous violence or almost like trauma porn kind of feeling stuff um there's like multiple incidences of all of them so it's not like you can just get past this one part and then enjoy the rest of the book it happened like over and over like i mentioned the treatment of women um there was also like just as an example of how unnecessary so much of this felt at one point uh this group of people kill and eat a dog and like immediately prior to that uh they have all come across this person who has been surviving by himself and they know that he's been like eating fish like somehow he's been getting fish and primarily surviving off of that so why the actual f would they not ask this person about how to go fishing or like where he was getting food before they killed and ate their pet like it just didn't make any sense and it was like i couldn't tell if this was another instance of the author just trying to get rid of extra characters she didn't care about anymore or if she just like really doesn't like dogs or like what was going on here because it made no sense and in fact immediately after that i'm pretty sure they actually did did go fishing or they learned how to get fish or whatever so it was completely unnecessary in every way so yeah what with the content the pretentious writing which i don't even think was that good all the time like i mentioned there were certain lines that were very good but it's not even like oh this is really high quality writing and i just don't understand it it's like i understood it i just don't think it's good i think she used all of her fancy metaphors and similes to hide deficiencies of story and characterization and you know what they don't even function that well as descriptions either and i gave nice at the circus 1.75 stars i also finished another buddy read in october and that was a dance of silver and shadow by melanie sellier this is a retelling of the 12 dancing princesses and this was a buddy read with my lovely friend giselle um as always i will link all the people i mentioned so we follow our main character liliana and her twin sister and they are sent on kind of like a diplomatic mission to another kingdom and then when they get there they find out that they have to compete in this trial um, in order to choose the like the princess um, that's going to marry a neighboring prince and nobody wants this to happen because this prince does not have a very good reputation there are all these rules and ancient magic and there's a lot of reasons why they are forced to compete and that was actually one of the things i really found interesting about this book is like the really interesting dynamic you have when you have a group of people who are all forced to compete in something that nobody wants to win but they are forced to do their best. One of the aspects of the magic is that it basically forces them to make a genuine effort. I also appreciate the fact that Melanie Sellier didn't spend too much time detailing like every single trial because there's a lot of them that happen in this book and you really only see the important parts which I actually liked. Um, it felt very natural like it didn't feel like you were missing important stuff. It was just like man I really don't want to sit through like 36 riddles or something. Uh, so she didn't do that for you which I liked. I also really liked the themes of sisterhood, women helping each other and looking out for each other. Like I love the fact that once everyone realizes that they're going to have to compete in this trial basically all of them like instantly band together in order to protect the younger girls and to make sure that they do everything in their power to make sure everybody makes it through these trials alive and safe and overall this book was just really nice like it was very pleasant to read i enjoyed talking about it with giselle uh, i was in the middle of some other 
kind of like heavier things at the same time that I was reading this. So this was just such a pleasant break. Um, I did have some problems with it. Like I really, really didn't like the romance. And the only other like major issue I would say is I feel like the main character and her twin sister, um, Liliana and I can't even remember her sister's name, I feel like they felt too similar. Um, like their relationship is supposed to be a very important one. And while I liked their interactions, I feel like there could have been more work done to differentiate her from all the other like 10 girls or something. But I did still have a lot of fun reading this and I gave it 3.5 stars. I also finished a book that has taken me eight months to read and that is Daughter of the Forest by Juliet Murillier. This is the first book in the Seven Waters series and as I said, this one took me a long time. <laughs> um, it is very big, but it shouldn't have taken me that long. And this is a fairy tale retelling of the fairy tale I always forget the name of. It's the one where the girls' brothers all get turned into swans. <laughs> that one. Um, and I have such conflicting feelings about this book. Like I think storytelling wise it's very well done. Um, and I think a lot of the issues I have with it are things that are more like personal preference or things that it's not really fair for me to hold against the book. That's where our main character she has a very close relationship with all of her six brothers and then something terrible happens and they get cursed and they all get turned into swans. So the only way that Sora can bring them back is if she's completely silent, so no speaking, no laughing, no screaming, nothing, um, for however long it takes her to like weave these shirts out of what sounds like thistle or like thorns even. That's the only way that she can break the curse is if she does that and then she puts the shirts on her brothers. And this book is basically her journey and her attempt to try and do that. And like I said, a lot of mixed feelings. Um, I'll talk about the things I thought were really good first. The writing is just beautiful. Like Juliet Merlier is obviously a very good storyteller. Um, like the atmosphere and the feeling of this of this story, like I just had such a clear idea of the setting and the vibe and the whole atmosphere of this book. Um, and I also really like that even though her writing is on the more flowery side, it never felt overdone. Like it didn't slow me down. I also liked one of the main male characters a lot more than I thought I would. Like I had kind of made up my mind that I wasn't gonna like him <laughs> just based on things I had like heard about this book um, or kind of the way he's like set up in the story but I ended up liking him quite a bit kind of against my will which I guess is just a testament to how well done his character was. And I also really thought that Sora was so well characterized as a silent character. Um, I have read several fairy tale retellings that involve a silent main character at this point and some of them are not very well done. Um, sometimes it almost seems like because a character can't speak, it's like suddenly they don't have any thoughts or personality, and that's not true. Um, it's not true with people, and it's not true with characters. So I was really impressed that Julia Morellier still had Sora communicate, and she still had like thoughts and wishes and feelings. Um, I do think that in a way her character felt a little less developed than it could have been just because her entire existence was so consumed with achieving this one goal. Like it made sense. Um, it just kind of made it sometimes feel like she was completely shaped by her circumstances rather than any personality of her own. Also, I had been warned that this book was like super slow and the beginning was really hard to get into. Um, and I actually didn't find that. I really liked the beginning, like Esther just kind of settling into this world and into these characters. And there's also a character named Simon who we meet at the beginning who I thought was very interesting. Like not likable really, because you're not supposed to like him, but as a character and as a possibility for growth, he was very interesting. And that actually leads me into the, some of the things that I did not like so much. So we spend so long getting attached to Simon um, and to kind of where the story is at that point, like a hundred plus pages. And then, I don't think this is a spoiler, but then stuff happens where basically he's not important for most of the book. And I really didn't like that because it kind of felt like, why did we waste all that time at the beginning then if he doesn't even really matter that much? And again, because of spoiler reasons, I'm not going to tell you like whether or not he does come back into the story, but it just didn't feel like all that time was necessary on him. And that's what I felt frustrated me about the beginning. Not that it was slow and like the pacing was really deliberate, but the fact that it kind of felt like none of what happened there really mattered. And then it took us a really, really long time to actually get to the point where the curse happens. Like this book like really spiked my anxiety in some ways because it was just like constantly waiting for the other shoe to drop because you know from the beginning what is going to happen basically. And it's like 200 pages before it does. and. It, that I just found very frustrating. It kind of, you kind of just wanted to like get it over with. In a way, Juliet Morillier's beautiful writing worked against her in that respect because it just, it, it was like describing things that were not beautiful and that were not supposed to sound beautiful. And like, I remember it very clearly, even before the really big incident that everyone warned me about, there's this one part near the beginning where she spends like a page or a page and a half just like describing an entire barn full of animals dying in like loving detail. And it was like really upsetting. There was just this weird disconnect sometimes between how pretty her words were 
and the things that were actually happening. And I don't know if that was deliberate, maybe, maybe it was and I'm just not picking up on it. And then also, so the other big thing that everyone warned me about is that there is an extremely graphic rape scene in this book. And normally I would just list that in the content warnings in the description box, but I actually want to mention it in the review because that is part of what, um, I don't know, it did form part of my opinion about this book and it felt it felt gratuitous and this is a case of something where I don't know if it's fair for me to hold this book like hold this against the book because I'm reaching a point in my reading life where I am just fed up with all of the violence against women in fantasy and this book was published in like 99 or something so it's not even really fair for me to say this book is doing something I don't like when it's like it was written before before I started noticing that you know it was just a really upsetting and like devastating scene to read and as I mentioned, um, you pretty much can't read fantasy without reading a lot of sexual assault scenes, unfortunately. So I've read quite a few, and this was one of the most upsetting I think I've ever read. And I also don't think it was necessarily handled in the best way, um, because for a while it, like, it definitely affects Sora, and it changes the way she sees people, it changes the way she sees the world, and all of that makes sense because she's had this terrible thing happen to her that leaves marks on people. But then, by the end of the book, it seems like some things don't really match up with that. And I don't think we got enough of a healing journey for her for some parts of the ending to make sense. And also the last really frustrating thing about this book, because believe it or not, like I did enjoy this, like I think this is a very good book. <laughs> but the last thing that really frustrated me about it is this particular way of building suspense. And Julie Morelier is not the only one who does this, like a lot of authors actually do this. And it's one of my least favorite things in the world to read. And that is when the narration of the book is like, oh, there's this really bad thing coming, but I'm not going to tell you what it is for a hundred pages. But everything would have been fine if this one thing hadn't happened. I really hate that. And this kind of goes back to the like, just wanting the other shoe to drop, you know, at the beginning. We expect bad things to happen in a story because otherwise there probably wouldn't be much conflict. But can you at least not like preemptively make us stressed about them before they happen? Like, I just feel like it's a very cheap way to build suspense because what I like in suspense is when the reader starts picking up on clues or like just a kind of an unsettling atmosphere or like you start anticipating something's gonna go wrong here, I don't know what it is. And then when you're proven right, it's interesting because you want to see what's going on. Whereas with this, it's like, I'm so mad, I just want, like, I know someone's gonna die, just kill the person and move on. <laughs> Please have the bad thing happen so I can continue reading. So anyway, a uh, very mixed experience with this one, as I said. I do plan to continue the series, though, and that's something. Next, I finished More to the Story by Hannah Khan. This is an own voices Muslim contemporary that is sort of a loose retelling of Little Women. Our main character is Jamila, and she is a character who's based on Jo March, and she is very happy in her life with her three sisters and her parents. And then uh, her father actually gets a job that means he will have to be away from their family for a long time. Jamila is also uh, very interested in writing. She loves being on her school newspaper. And then she starts having some frustrating things happen with that. And then on top of all of this, um, one of her sisters actually gets sick. And I loved this story so, so much. Um, first off, the retelling aspects I think were done really, really well. I really, really liked seeing how Hannah Khan interpreted some aspects of the story or some character traits. Um, I just thought that was so interesting. I think this is definitely one you can really really enjoy even if you don't know the story of Little Women or it's not one of your favorite books. I still think this book really stands on its own and I think this is one of the looser retellings I've read and I think that worked really well. Um, I was also so impressed with how easily this story translated to a contemporary middle grade novel. I loved Jamila as a main character. She is so strong and like she makes mistakes but you still love her and you still feel for her and you understand why she does the things she does. Um, and I really liked seeing some of her friendships too. And another thing I really liked about this book is I feel like when you're writing for a certain preteen age range, sometimes one of the things that authors uh, show or talk about is kind of that phase where her kids are just starting to possibly see other kids as like in a romantic sense, possibly. Um, and sometimes I feel like that can be done in a way that's very cringy or that feels very like forced or weird. Um, and in this book it didn't. Like there's no like romance subplot really or anything. But I feel like the way Hannah Khan handled like the way that some of these feelings start affecting the way she interacts with like friends or people that she has known, I think it felt very believable and very natural. And another mark of Hannah Khan's really good storytelling is how unexpected so much of this book felt. She's such a compelling writer and she's so good at emotionally connecting you to these characters that even if I had a prediction or a suspicion for something that was going to happen, you were still kind of on the edge of your seat waiting to see if that would happen or how that would happen or how that was going to affect people and I just love this book so much. I think I mentioned in the tag video where I talked about this book that I made it the whole book without crying 
and then like the last chapter or like the epilogue or whatever just like broke me but in the best way. I loved this book. I gave it five stars. Can't recommend it enough. Next I finished Gods of Jade and Shadow by Silvia Moreno Garcia. Thank you again Taylor so much for giving this to me. We follow our main character Cassiopeia and she and her mother have kind of been forced into basically servitude. Um, taking care of the house and cooking and cleaning for Cassiopeia's grandfather and his family. And then one day Cassiopeia opens a chest and accidentally releases one of the Mayan gods of death. Uh, and he is on a journey to get back his throne from his brother who stole it from him. And he takes Cassiopeia with him. Things start getting complicated because Cassiopeia's humanity is actually starting to affect the Mayan death god whose name is Honkame. And this was just so beautiful. I really, really loved the character development of our two main characters. I mean, Cassiopeia is the main character, but Hunkame is quite important as well. Um, Cassiopeia, I just love her with all of my heart, and I feel like she is such a good example of how authors can write a headstrong, even stubborn character and not make them a complete idiot. I just love her. She's so strong and resilient and clever. I loved the world and the writing of this book, like the atmosphere and the general like feeling of this book is so specific. It's like 1920s jazz age in Mexico City. And then of course there's also a lot of Mayan folklore and mythology woven in and all of it works so cohesively and so beautifully. I also have to mention how much I enjoyed the road trip part of this book because we all know I don't really like road trip stories very often or when I do it's a big deal and this one I loved. I think one of the reasons it worked for me so much is that like it wasn't just a scene in a journey book. It was like it showed you something about the characters. Like you were seeing how as they spent more time with each other, they gradually started changing. And you would also start learning more about the world because they would talk to each other about what was going on. The only reasons I gave this 4.5 stars instead of five is for one thing, like I would have wanted something a little different for the ending. Um, but the other thing that I didn't like so much is I feel like Martine's chapters were pretty unnecessary. Um, Martine is Cassiopeia's cousin. And even though I ended up finding his story very interesting as as a parallel or as a journey. I still don't think we needed all the chapters with him. I just wanted to get back to Cassiopeia and Hunkame. Uh, Martin was kind of just a drag. Next I finished A School for Unusual Girls by Kathleen Baldwin. This is the first book in the Strange House series and we follow our main character... I just forgot her name. Georgie. Uh, I think short for Georgiana. And she gets sent to this finishing school and then when she gets there she realizes that things are not as they seem. Um, basically there might be there might be uh, classes and training going on at this boarding school that people don't actually know about. And this was an interesting reading experience. Um, I'm definitely going to continue the series because it's a companion series and the books that, and the later books in the series follow characters that I was much more interested in and that I'm really excited about getting their story. This one I did not like so much. Um, I found Georgie a really, really frustrating main character. Like there's just not a lot to her. I don't really know much about her personality besides like these very specific passions she has. Like she's not like other girls because she's so passionate about science and stuff. And because she gets to the school and starts finding like-minded people, it's not quite like the not like other girls feeling, but I just feel like Georgie felt very flat as a character um, and kind of like inconsistent too. Like I remember there's one part like a couple hundred pages into this book where Georgie thinks to herself like, I had never met anyone who was as good as mathematics as I was. And I just like read that and I'm like, wait, you're good at math? Like this has literally never come up before. Um, and I also really didn't like her romance. Like I love banter in relationships, but this was the kind of banter where it's like, he's just talking to you like you're stupid. And when they would have one of their little like verbal sparring sessions, it almost always felt like he won. So it kind of like, not, not like their relationship was unequal, but it just like wasn't pleasant because I'm like, this isn't really, like this isn't really flirty feeling. It feels like he's making you feel stupid or like bad about yourself or like making fun of you and I don't think that's cute. However, I did really really like the side characters. Um, I mentioned like really being interested in the companion books um, because they follow some of the other girls who I found much more compelling than Georgie. And I also really really loved the headmistress of their school. I just find her so interesting. There's also like this very small hint of a romance subplot for her that I found much more compelling than Georgie's. <laughs> so I ended up giving A School for Unusual Girls 2.75 stars. Next I finished Slay by Brittany Morris and in this book we follow our main character Kira and she is the creator of an online game called Slay but nobody knows that she is the creator and the game is completely based on African culture and Kira developed it as a way 
great for black gamers to have a safe space. But she doesn't feel like she can ever tell people that she created it because it even seems like people around her who really care about her, even they wouldn't really understand uh, this aspect of her. Like her boyfriend is really against video games because he feels like it's something that is used to keep black men down. So Kira doesn't feel like she can really tell anybody about this huge passion and skill of hers. And then one day a boy is actually murdered in connection with this game. And then Kira starts worrying if she is responsible for this. And then Slay also hits mainstream media and it's labeled as exclusionary and violent and it's starting to get all this really bad press. And then on top of that, a racist troll infiltrates the game. And then Kira starts wondering how she can protect her own identity and protect this game and this, this environment that she has created and everything that kind of goes from there. I think Brittany Morris is just a phenomenal writer. Like the actual storytelling of this book is so good. You know, you start a fantasy and the world building at the beginning is sort of like setting up the world and the magic. Well, with contemporaries, I feel like you jump in and what the author needs to really set up is like the main characters and their relationships with each other. And I feel like she was just so good at that. Like right from the beginning, I knew like who was close with who and who maybe had some kind of friction in their relationship. And it was all just built so gradually too, because there wasn't like this info dump where it's like, ah, oh, here's my boyfriend who does this. And here is my sister who gets angry at him when he does that. Like those little hints would be dropped throughout the beginning of the book so that by the time you start getting into the heavier plot stuff, like you knew how people related to each other and it was just like so good. I actually really loved all the parts that took place in the game and seeing a little bit about how Kira came up with her ideas for the game and kind of the development stuff. It's not like super heavy on the technical aspect, but I honestly wasn't anticipating this being one of my favorite parts of the book because I've never been super interested in like virtual reality stuff in books. Um, like I have no interest in reading Ready Player One. So I wasn't necessarily anticipating that being a real highlight of the book for me, but it was, it was so well written and like I could picture everything that was happening really well. Um, and it was also just very, interesting. Like I loved seeing the different card ideas that Kira came up with and it was just such a fun part of the book while also being like so cool that we're seeing a black girl involved in coding. I also think Brittany Morris did an amazing job of combining the more like story aspects with the issues or the topics that she was covering. Like it never felt like here is the section where she just explains the moral of this book. Like it felt so well balanced with the story itself. I also was not expecting there to be multiple points of view in this book. Um, and at first when we switched POV, I was kind of upset because like I was really enjoying following Kira, but I ended up thinking that was another aspect that was done really well. Like you really understood why each of those points of view was there and like really enjoying all of them. The only thing I didn't think was really amazingly well done is there were a couple of kind of important like subplots um, with some of the other like point of view characters. Like there's one in particular I'm thinking of that is like pretty important and it just didn't really feel like it was fully dealt with. Um, but other than that, I think this book was phenomenal and I gave it 4.5 stars. Next, I finished Dead Beautiful by Yvonne Woon. This is the first book in a trilogy and shout out to Ariel from She Wants Addiction. Um, she actually did a really fun like vlog video picking out the books that she was going to send because I actually won this in a giveaway. And as both of us noticed, like the tagline on this book is kind of wild. It says a Harry Potter star and a twilight finish and like regardless of how you feel about either of those things like that is a bold claim to make <laughs> we follow our main character renee and at the very beginning of the book um both of her parents are murdered so she gets sent off to stay for a little while with her grandfather i think and then very quickly after that she is enrolled in this elite boarding school that her family went to and she's not really told why about a lot of this and as she's at the school she starts noticing some really suspicious things. Nobody will really explain it to Renee. So she decides to start finding out the answers for herself. And she also gets tangled up with this very handsome boy at the school named Dante. This seems like a very kind of stereotypical paranormal story on the surface. There were a lot of things about it that I think were handled really well in a way that really sets it apart. So one of my favorite things about this book was the creepiness. Like the really like chilling atmosphere of this book is something I didn't really expect going in. Um, I mean, even when you get to the school and like, okay, there's some kind of sketchy things happening. It's a little bit odd and unusual. I didn't really anticipate how dark some of it would get and I thought that was done so well. Like I was actually reading this book at night um, a couple of times and I was like this is like really creepy but in a really enjoyable way. I also think the writing of this book was really good for the most part. Uh, like it flowed really well. I also think the writing helped with the emotional stakes of this book. Like right at the beginning of the book Renee loses her parents in a horrible way and that actually affects her. Um, like it actually changes the way she interacts with people and the way she sees the world and she still thinks about it. And I feel like sometimes with books where there's like this big tragedy at the beginning, like for a little while it'll bother them, but then you'll kind of get caught up in the rest of the plot of the book. And it's kind of like they forget it happens. And that never happened with this book. It felt like a very like real and present thing. Like it felt like a believable way to handle that kind of thing. Um, and I was just very impressed with that. I also really, really liked a lot of the side characters in this book. Um, like her roommate, Renee's roommate, 
ended up being one of my favorites. I just found her so interesting um, and kind of fun. Like she was a good kind of like, not exactly comic relief, but kind of like chill relief. <laughs> like Renee would be like really caught up and obsessed with this mystery or with this, ha this handsome boy or something. And her roommate would just be like, okay, whatever, I'm going to math class. And I also really liked how surprising some of the plot twists or the plot elements in this book were. Um, like I had some theories about what was going on and some of them were right, but some of them weren't. And they were very unique, I think, or very unusual at least. My only real negatives about it are, once again, I did not like the romance. I feel like the romance could have been cut out completely. But I will say that some later parts of the book actually explain why the romance was done that way. Um, and I think, I think that actually did help. And also the main character, like Renee, I liked her, but I liked her most when she wasn't with Dante because I feel like whenever she was with Dante, she became a lot more boring and just like hyper focused on him. Um, I liked Renee best when she was interacting with other characters or doing things by herself. So I ended up so pleasantly surprised by this book and I gave it 3.75 stars. Next, I finished The 26th of November, a Pride and Prejudice comedy of farcical proportions by Elizabeth Adams. Basically what would happen if Elizabeth was forced to relive the night of the Netherfield Ball over and over and over again. And I really, really enjoyed this. Um, I've never really been interested in that kind of like Groundhog's Day premise, but the way this one was described and the fact that it was Jane Austen and everything interested me and I'm really glad I read it because I had so much fun with this. I think the writing and the characterization were really good. Um, the very beginning of this, like the first few pages or so, even the first chapter, are a little bit of a slow start because it's basically summarizing a lot of the events of Pride and Prejudice leading up to the Netherfield Ball. But after that, I really, really enjoyed the writing um, and I really liked the direction that Elizabeth Adams took the plot in. Like Elizabeth Adams is very upfront about the fact that she's just having fun with this. Like on the book, it actually says, no carriages, sisters, or suitors were harmed in the writing of this book. But I feel like even though it is kind of a lighthearted take on it, the characterization was actually pretty solid. And even though like the events of this book are obviously very different from what happened in Pride and Prejudice, none, nothing ever felt like so, so out of character that I like couldn't enjoy the story or anything. Also, I appreciate the focus of like Darcy basically just being like an awkward nerd because I feel like that's something that we need to appreciate more. Um, is like, yeah, I mean, he's not a perfect character, but a lot of the things that he does that make people think he's a jerk, it's like, he's just an awkward introvert standing in a corner. And I really liked seeing the character development for Elizabeth and especially her changing feelings on Darcy as she gets to know him. And obviously she's spending a lot of time with him because she's repeating the same day over and over, not really knowing why. It was so fun to see her like try different things and to like get to know people in different ways. And I just like really enjoyed this. I was going through a really, really stressful time while I was reading this and this was exactly what I wanted. I was a tiny bit disappointed in the ending just because I kept hoping for this one particular thing to happen that I thought would have been so cool and so clever and it didn't happen, something else did. But other than that, I really, really enjoyed this and I gave it four stars. Next, I finished Planting Stories, The Life of Librarian and Storyteller Pura Belpre by Anika Aldemoy-Denis and illustrated by Paula Escobar. This was actually a recommendation from my lovely friend Priscilla over at Bookie Charm. I will link the video where she talks about them and reviews them. So this picture book tells the story of the life of Pura Belpre um, and the Belpre Award for picture books is actually named after her, which I didn't know anything about. And then after I read this, I started seeing books that had won that award. And it's a story about her life and the reason she starts telling stories and the folklore of Puerto Rico and how that really inspired her to start telling these stories and to have kids like learn about their heritage and I just thought this was such a beautiful book. The illustrations are stunning, like they're so bright and detailed. I just love the way that this was illustrated, um, like the scenes from the stories she tells and also the everyday scenes, all of them are done beautifully. And I ended up giving this picture book 4.5 stars, although I might bump it up later because this very short picture book made me tear up like at least two or three times. Next, I finished a romance book that I feel like has been all over book blogging land recently, and that is Well Met by Jen DeLuca. Uh, this takes place at a Renaissance fair and our main character is Emily, I think. Um, and after some really horrible personal life stuff happens, she ends up traveling to stay with her sister as her sister recovers from a car accident. Emily ends up helping at the Renaissance Fair so that her niece can participate. And then she meets this guy named Simon and they really butt heads. They cannot stand each other. They don't get along at all. But then they find out that when they are both in character during the Renaissance Fair, they're actually very attracted to each other and they like flirt and they banter. So this is a story about their relationship. And I was pretty disappointed in this book. I did really love the fair setting. Um, that was actually one of my favorite parts of the book and it was a little frustrating at the beginning because Emily so clearly didn't care, <laughs> didn't care about being there. Um, so seeing her grow and start to appreciate all the work people are putting into this and like the, the fun and the importance of this kind of thing, I did really, really like that. I also really liked the important messages about family and about taking care of people and still still doing what you want to do. And there were also a couple of side characters who I really liked. Um, I actually really ended up liking Emily's niece. I can't remember her name, uh, but she was actually really fun. Like, I feel like she felt like a believable 
teenage character without falling into a lot of the stereotypes that adults tend to write teenagers as, or at least some adult authors do. And I also think like the first main kiss scene between Simon and Emily, because obviously, you know, it's a romance, they do get together. Um, I think that scene was really, really well done and I really liked that. Unfortunately, I did not like a lot of the other things about this book. Um, Emily as a main character just felt very bland to me. And even Simon, like I liked him, but I still don't feel like like he had like a couple of really dramatic things in his backstory and I feel like that was like his whole character and the kind of the same thing for Emily. So even though I liked seeing them start to work through these issues, um, it still didn't really make them feel like fully developed characters because they had like no personality outside of these big things that had happened. I also got really frustrated because um, near the like three quarter mark I think of this book I was feeling very impressed that the, the author hadn't fallen into this specific romance trope that I really really hate. And then it happened. <laughs> like it's one that happens in a lot of romance books or even like just contemporary books and I don't like it and I still didn't like it here and especially after feeling like wow I'm really impressed that the author is writing a story without using that. But my main issue unfortunately had to do with the romance itself and I just found this whole hate to love thing very hard to believe and hard to enjoy. Um, I think in general I'm a harder sell with hate to love when it's in a contemporary setting versus like a historical fiction or a fantasy for example and I think part of that is because like it's hard for me to read a contemporary hate to love and not feel like one of two things is happening like one of them is like this guy is just treating you like crap and like I would not want to date someone who treated me this way um or number two which is kind of the opposite and like this doesn't even feel like hate to love like somebody said something snarky to you about the way you filled out your form and now he's like your mortal enemy like that's a little ridiculous and I feel like with this book it was kind of like I had kind of both of those problems in combination especially the second one like there were a lot of points where I'm like I'm sorry wait like you guys hate each other because of this one thing that happened like I understand first impressions of people but like this was just a little unbelievable for me and then there were a couple of times where it's like if somebody was making my like working day this miserable I don't like I don't think that's cute either so anyway I gave well met 3.5 stars originally but I'm kind of wondering if I should drop it down to three because the more I think about it the more I'm like this is not as fun as I wanted it to be. The next book I finished was Tempt by Natalia Jaster and I received a free e-arc in exchange for an honest review. This is the third book in the Selfish Myths series and this is a companion series and the basic setup for this world is that we're following um, different deities or like they're personifications of emotions and their jobs is to sort of, sort of like cause those emotions in humans on earth and as the series goes on we're actually starting to see that some of these deities are actually getting kind of uncomfortable with the fact that they are taking free will away from humans and starting to wonder if there's a better way to do things or if there's a way to balance what they do with free will. Um, and I'm actually really enjoying that exploration in the series. So this third book is a Hades and Persephone retelling and we follow Wonder and Malice and the way their relationship develops when they basically are forced to work together and to travel to a magical library um, in order to try and find some information that is going to help all of these deities who are starting to kind of rebel against this idea of controlling human emotions like this. And I really liked this. Um, I think this is my second favorite in the series at this point. I really, really loved the magical library setting. And I also thought the way that Wonder and Malice's backstories were explored was really interesting. Um, one thing that I'm consistently impressed with, with with Natalie Jaster is how good she is at flashback scenes because I hate reading flashback scenes. I find them really boring and I always like hers and sometimes they're actually some of my favorite scenes in the whole book and this book was no different. I found it very interesting to see how Wonder and Malice both ended up where they were. Um, as for the characters themselves, I really liked Wonder and eventually I liked Malice. The romance took me a little bit to get into. By the way, this is new adult so, you know, be prepared for that going in. I found Malice really unlikable at the beginning in a way that I'm not sure we were supposed to because one of the things he does is like he would make like super sexual comments or like gestures at Wonder to deliberately make her feel uncomfortable and that's something that I just personally really don't like but eventually I do think he developed past that and I did end up really liking their interactions. Um, I love the way that they would like flirt with each other with like books and then I also think that there was a tendency in this book to lean a little too heavily on the idea of finding legends or like loopholes that are going to fix everything but I do think the way the book ended kind of made up for that a little bit. As for the Hades and Persephone elements, um, I did like those and I this was sort of a looser retelling than I think some others. Um, like instead of the underworld you have kind of an underground library and things like that but I did like that um, and I think that the writing I also felt kind of mixed about because 
Natalia Jaster has some really, really beautiful phrases and sentences. And then there's sometimes where she kind of gets a little bit into purple prose territory. There's this one like reveal that we find out about one of the characters that supposedly is not supposed to be a big deal, but the way other characters treated it, it was a really big deal. And that felt kind of uncomfortable to me. But overall, I did like this book. I gave it 3.5 stars. Next, I finished Grandmother's Chocolate or El Chocolate de Abuelita by Mara Price. And illustrations are by Lisa Fields. And this is also from Priscilla's recommendations video. And basically in this book, a little girl starts to ask her grandmother questions about hot chocolate. And then her grandmother starts telling her stories about her ancestors, like the Mayans and the Aztecs and how they used chocolate. I also really loved this one. I gave it four stars. Um, I really, really liked the illustration style in this one as well. It's very expressive. Like I think one of my favorite things about it is how good a job the illustrator did of showing the faces and the expressions on these different characters and also the relationship between the little girl and her grandmother. I think that's something that really came through beautifully in the illustrations and also in the storytelling, like the writing itself. And I just think this was a really beautiful exploration of family relationships and culture. I also finished another buddy read that I did with Giselle and that is House of Salt and Sorrows by Erin A. Craig. This is a kind of creepy atmospheric horror uh, retelling of the Twelve Dancing Princesses and our main character Annalie. Several of her sisters have died in horrible ways and people on the island are starting to think that her family is cursed. Annalie starts seeing these horrible like uh, ghostly apparitions for dead sisters and so she's trying to figure out like what's going on with those and what this means and what is going on with this curse that they seem to have and especially after Emily becomes convinced that these deaths were not accidents and I really enjoyed this. I mentioned that I really like kind of water adjacent fantasy and this this was a great example of that. Um, I think the world building was done so well. It was so interesting and it was so seamlessly woven into the story. You can use familiar world building elements but if you use them a particular way or you tell them a particular way or you're just really really good at this kind of thing then I think they can feel really fresh and new and I really liked the focus on family relationships specifically sister relationships and even the sisters who have died it's like you really especially for the one that died most recently you still get a feeling for who she was as a person and the loss that these girls are feeling um, and even though some characters move on quicker than others it was just very like this book felt very like permeated by that feeling of sisterly relationships. And I also really liked the writing. There were just really beautiful passages about the beliefs of this island and how they related to the mainland and the different like buildings and structures and like some of the dances that these sisters end up going on because of course it's a 12 dancing princesses retelling. And I just loved the way all of those were done. Like it never felt like too much, but I also had such a good idea of this setting and of what things looked like or just kind of the vibe that you get from them. And speaking of the vibe, I think that the horror atmosphere or like the creepiness was done so so well in this book. Like there were a couple of scenes in particular that were just so creepy and so well done and I think one of the things that made the horror aspects work so well is like the juxtaposition between what was scary and why it wasn't supposed to be. So like these horrifying apparitions that Annalise starts seeing of her dead sisters, I think one of the reasons they were so effective is because for one thing they were just really grotesque and awful some of them but also like that contrast with like these are people that you love like these are people who you're not supposed to be scared by and I feel like that really added to the unsettling feeling and I think that's one of the reasons I enjoyed the creepy atmosphere like so much it still felt based in like character relationships like it felt meaningful I have to say this is yet yeah, another case where I didn't like the romance at all I also feel like Annalie could have been developed a little bit more as a protagonist um like she did have personality. It wasn't like she was a completely blank slate or anything, but I think that if we had cut out the romance, we could have maybe spent some more time getting to know her and spending more time with her and her sisters because I think the scenes between the sisters were so well done and I would have loved to see more of those. There's also this thing about the very, very ending that I didn't love, but overall I liked the plot. And also I feel like this book has gotten incredibly mixed reviews and I have a theory about that. There is a certain kind of reviewer, and I know this is a pretty small proportion of the reviewing like entity, but they are quite vocal. So you see this a lot. The loves to talk about how YA never goes far enough or is never dark enough or is just never meaningful enough for them. And then when those people actually get a YA book that is very dark and or that has bad things happen or that like goes there, you know, in a very significant way, they complain about it because that is not what they wanted or expected from this idea they had about what YA is supposed to be. And honestly, I I think that's part of the reason why this book gets such mixed reviews. I'm not saying everybody. Obviously you can like this book for reasons other than that, um, but I just feel like a lot of the negative reviews I've been seeing for this book 
I'm wondering if some of them are for that reason because I put off reading Heartless by Marissa Meyer for years because everyone talked about how bad it was and it turns out it's actually a great book and it just doesn't end the way people expect YA books to end and that's on them. Anyway, I'm gonna go off on a whole nother tangent here and I'm not gonna do that because we have one more book to talk about and that is Great Goddesses Life Lessons from Myths and Monsters by Nikita Gill and I received this book in a Goodreads giveaway in exchange for an honest review and I absolutely loved this. Um, I've read one other poetry book by Nikita Gale and I think this one is even better. One of the only things that I didn't love about her other book I read is that there were occasionally poems that felt like they mixed her poetic style with some very like modern feeling phrases and it felt a little bit jarring and in this book that was almost completely gone. This was such a beautiful collection. Like the way that Nikita Gale reimagines certain myths and stories and characters from Greek mythology, like the way she pairs that with uh, like current issues was just done so beautifully. Like some of the themes that this one handled that I think were done so well are healing, love, forgiveness, sisterhood, anger, compassion, and I also want to mention a few of my specific like favorite kinds of poems or stories. So these are not by title of poem, this is just like their like the focus of them. Kira's redemption arc, Aphrodite and Hephaestus's story and like their kind of relationship. Um, the characterization of Hades is really wonderful. The one on Argos, Odysseus's dog, was just so good and it made me really emotional but I loved it. Um, the poem about Iphigenia was fantastic. Uh, the poem of Helen of Troy I really loved. Like the poem about Megara who is the wife of Hercules. Her poem was just so heartbreakingly current um, but I thought it was just beautifully told and also the way that she ended this poetry collection. Like I never would have thought it would make sense to end this collection with the kinds of poems she did but it somehow just worked perfectly. Uh, I absolutely fell in love with this. I gave this poetry book five stars and I'll actually link my full Goodreads review if you want like a little bit more detail but it's hard to describe poetry but I really really love this one. Okay everybody so those are all of the books that I read in October minus my audiobooks. Let me know if you have read any of these, what you thought of them, or if you're planning to pick them up. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you soon with another video and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye!